You know, when we started this collection and the teachers got together, we were discussing the different books we'd be teaching. Of course, I was amazed to find out that I had Leviticus. Actually, in Greek, the word means for pertaining to the Levites, for the Levites. And you may be saying, well, no wonder I've never read it. It's for the Levites. That gets me off the hook. But actually, that is not at all what it's about. In fact, the Levites are only mentioned four times, and it's for the people. It's for the people and has to do with God's instructions. It's an instruction book to them about how to live a holy life and how to worship. It is a wonderful book and one that you will really enjoy if you ever decide to study it. It's not the kind that you're going to curl up in front of the fire for a relaxing evening. I'll warn you about that. But it is truly a book that is going to answer a lot of questions for you. It's an instruction book for the people. It's a guide to worship. It tells them what to expect, what to bring, all about worship, the things that they need to know. It's vital instructions for the people of Israel of that day and time, and it's vital for us today, too. It's very misunderstood, too, because we really believe that it's only for the Levites, and that's not true, or only for the Israelites. There are many, many things in the book that we need. It helps us to understand so much about the rest of Scripture, particularly the book of Hebrews. Did you know that Hebrews is really the commentary on the book of Leviticus? And if you don't know Leviticus, then it'll be very difficult for you to understand Hebrews. It'll become very obscure for you. And so you want to know all of it, which is what God has revealed to us. Don't we want to know what God has revealed? Of course we do. Well, uh, it pictures the promised Messiah. It tells us about God's desire to dwell among us. Imagine that. The God of this universe wanting to dwell among us. What an incredible thing. And it, it explains the sacrificial system of Israel, the way to God. We're going to look at that. And it also explains God's uh, desire for us to live a holy life, God's requirement, which is our walk with God. So we're going to be looking at all of that. Now, the who, what, when, and where of Leviticus is the who is Moses. Moses is the author, and Moses and Aaron and the priest are the main characters. The what, it's the book of holiness. The where is it takes place in the Sinai Desert. Actually, there's no movement at all in this book. It takes place in the Sinai Desert at the foot of Mount Sinai. That is present-day Saudi Arabia. And then the when is about a year and one month after the children of Israel have exited from Egypt and they are encamped God is teaching them and they are encamped at the bottom of the Mount, uh, Mount Sinai and the why is that it is Israel's guide to holiness how to live a holy life and how to worship the way God would have them do this how is Christ revealed in this book well he is throughout it but mainly he is revealed as the perfect sacrifice and we find the scripture that backs that up in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 10. And you'll want to read about that because Christ is concealed continually through the book of Leviticus. Now, all of us ladies enjoy taking tours of homes and churches and buildings. And you have somebody sign up for a tour and here they, they're ready, aren't they? You're ready to go. Well, we're going to tour the tabernacle right now. That's our first thing. And you'll want to look at your outline because I want to show you as we go through the tabernacle simply, uh, not in detail, but simply how Jesus Christ is revealed throughout it. So I want you to walk with me as we enter the courtyard at the east gate. Now that is very significant throughout scripture. As we do that, we come to an article of furniture, if you will, that's the very first thing we see in front of us, and it is the brazen altar. The truth of it is, we can go no further in our approach to God than the altar. That's the first place we have to come. Our approach to God is by sacrifice. So the brazen altar represents Christ's sacrifice for us. The next thing is the bronze laver. This was a huge basin filled with water, and the priest washed in this all day long. And they did this because they continually dealt with the sin of the world, of the people who brought the sacrifices, the sinners, and the blood of the sacrifice. And so to be ceremoniously clean, they constantly had to be washing in this uh, bronze laver. So the bronze laver represents our need for cleansing from sin. 
And then there are the types of Christ in the first room we're going to enter, and that's the holy place. Only the priests could go in, and there are three places of interest there. On the north wall, you'll see the table of showbread. Always on the table of showbread were 12 loaves of bread representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And this represents Christ, the table of showbread, as the bread of life. The next thing you'll see on the opposite wall, or the southern wall, is the golden lampstand. The golden lampstand was filled continuously and burned continuously with olive oil. This represents Jesus Christ as the light of the world. Then the altar of incense is placed against the veil, and the veil separates the Holy of Holies from the, most, from the holy place. We're now in the holy place, and at the end of that room is the altar of incense. As the incense goes up to the Lord and he smells the pleasing aroma, it represents the prayers of all the saints. And so we see the altar of incense representing Christ as the intercessor of our prayers. And then we approach that veil, and the veil is an intricately and elaborately embroidered piece of cloth that is wide as a hand breath. That room was entered only once a year. We'll talk about it a little bit later, but it separates the holy place from the most holy place or the holy of holies. And the priest would go into that room and in there he would make atonement for the sins of all the nation of Israel once a year on the day of atonement. Now the veil represents the barrier between us and God before the cross, prior to the cross. In that room, the holy, most holy place or the holy of holies is one piece of furniture and it's the Ark of the Covenant. That is a, an elaborately decorated box covered in gold with a lid on it. Inside that box are the tablets of the Ten Commandments. The lid is called the mercy seat. And so here we see the Ark of the Covenant representing Christ as our mercy seat. It's so important that we see the pictures and the types of Christ throughout the book of Leviticus and particularly in the tabernacle. You want to study that because if you study it in much more detail, you'll be amazed and surprised at how many times you'll see the Lord Jesus Christ right there in that one structure. Now you remember that the tabernacle was patterned and then constructed at the end of the book of, of Exodus. And God was so pleased with what they had done that his glory filled the tabernacle. And it's at this point that we pick up the book of Leviticus. Actually, the tabernacle was constructed in the book of Exodus. And now we'll have no movement but instruction in the book of Leviticus as they begin to use the tabernacle for what God intended for worship, for he was going to come down and dwell among his people. And what a glorious thing this was to have seen the radiance of God as he came to meet with his people in the tabernacle. Now tabernacle means tent. And of course, the tent had to be picked up and moved, so it's portable. That's the purpose of having it where it would collapse because, you know, God would say to them, camp here or it's time to move, and they would move out. And so the tabernacle went with them. In the book of Leviticus, we're going to begin seeing how we approach God, and the first thing we're going to see is the way to God. Chapters 1 through 16 have to do with the way to God. But don't you know the Israelites felt that God was unapproachable? Because after all, as they camped out at the foot of Mount Sinai, what they had seen of him was, it, was the mountain quaking and fire coming up and smoke and thunder as God thundered from the clouds. And they had seen the mighty miracles. They had seen the Red Sea part. They had seen all of these things and approach God. They knew that God said, if you do this or you do this, you'll, you'll die. And so they were probably very frightened and like we feel sometimes, God, God was unapproachable. But that's not true. God came to meet with his people. He came to dwell among us. He desires that. And so he made a way. He made a way. What a wonderful thing. The way was different then. 
at that particular time, the way was by blood, the blood of sacrifice. I don't like blood. I don't know many people who do. That's probably a lot of the reasons that people don't like the book of Leviticus is because it's filled with blood. It's throughout it. But you know, my daddy had a saying. I bet your daddy did too. And I hated it. And it was because I said so. That was his answer for my why on everything because he said so. And I thought, when I grow up, I'll never use that. And of course, I've found that is the most appropriate answer I can think of for sometimes. And I'm sure my children who hated it use it as well. But I'll tell you, God said so. And there's a price to be paid for our sin. And it's costly. Our sin cost God. And we say, why blood? But our sin sickens God. It sickens him. And he doesn't wink at it and overlook it and say, oh, I know she meant well, that's okay. Sin has to be paid for. Sin was paid for the first time back in Genesis. You heard that when Eleanor was teaching you about how God took animals and he killed those animals and used their skin to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve. That was the very first sacrifice. Hebrews 9.22 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. This is a very sobering question, and I have to ask myself this a lot. If we lived in Israel, how many animals would have to die for the sin that you and I have already committed? Isn't that a sobering thought that we might have to have already brought an animal to the tabernacle. And you know, ladies, I don't know if you know this or not. I remember when I learned this, how hard it was for me. But they didn't just come with that little animal and drop it off at the door and give it to the priest. That perfect little lamb or little goat, as it was for the common people. And we read about this in Leviticus chapter 4. No, they didn't do this. They brought the animal for the sacrifice, that innocent, perfect animal, and they stood there in the presence of the priest and they put their hand on the head of that animal. And nothing magical happened, but symbolically something, went, something happened here symbolically as the sin left me or you, the sinner, and was transferred into that animal. And then you didn't leave, but you yourself had to slit the throat of that animal. Can you imagine that? The blood on your hands from the sin, that would make me think twice about the things that I do that are so displeasing to God and so sinful. You know, God wanted man to know the awfulness of his sin so that we would live a holy life. It's called atonement. It's a covering, but it's temporary in this day and time. Now we know that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, has taken away our sin forever and forever. He has atoned for us. Now chapters 1 through 7 of Leviticus explain the different types of sacrifices. There are five of them, and I'm not going to go into detail, but you do need to read about them 